Robin Hood Radio and the Robin Hood Radio Network is proud to present Leonard Lopate at Large, lively hour-long in-depth discussions providing overviews and context to topics usually covered in partial measures. His guests include leading thinkers, scientists, artists, economists, farmers, historians, authors, and politicians. Mr. Lopate is a Peabody Award winner whose numerous honors include three Associated Press Awards and three James Beard Awards. Welcome to Leonard Lopate at Large. I'm Leonard Lopate. In the past, countries knew that they were at war when tanks rolled over their borders and shots were fired. Today, computers are rapidly replacing tanks thanks to dramatic advances in technology and the ability to disseminate stories on social media. Rather than participate in an arms race, countries can now engage in a very effective form of asymmetric warfare called weaponized narrative. Arizona State University has embarked on a major venture called the Weaponized Narrative Initiative, and its co-directors, Brad Allenby and Joel Garreau, join us now to talk about why potential adversaries like Russia have been so successful in exploiting our weaknesses and look at the challenges that emerging technologies present, not just to military and security organizations, but to democratic principles and institutions. I'm pleased to welcome Brad Allenby and Joel Garreau to our show now. Hello. Hello, Leonard. When did the term narrative widen from just meaning a story in a book? Can I take a crack at that? Of course. Yeah, um, go ahead. You could take of, turns. Uh, weaponized narrative is that it's an attack that seeks to undermine the opponent's civilization, identity, and will. And the point of this is by generating confusion and complexity in political and social systems. It confounds response on the part of the defender. So what this means is this is a lot more than just disinformation. This is an attack on the United States, the Western alliance, democracy itself, and even the Enlightenment. And, Brad, do you want to throw out an example of a narrative that is under attack? Yeah, to, to begin with, um, as, as we became, over the last uh, decades, as we became more interested in strategies, uh, corporate strategies and uh, military strategies, uh, narrative began to assume more and more importance because we began to realize that stories were as powerful, if not more powerful, than uh, the application of uh, regular kinetic conventional uh, force. So a narrative is essentially a long story that is designed to shift somebody to share your perspective. Uh, A shorter story, by the way, is called a script. So if I'm selling uh, soft drinks, I may tell you that you're part of the young generation. Well, that's kind of a script. What that's doing is that's sucking you in to the idea that you belong to a certain group and that the way you show you belong is by consuming my product, which is what I'm trying to get you to buy. A narrative is a more complex story that begins to build not just, say, allegiance to a particular product, but begins to build tribes. And what what we've entered is an era... When developing narratives uh, can be weaponized, that is to say that if I'm an adversary of the United States, I can begin to develop complex stories that feed off stories that are already part of the United States, that begin to create tribes the way I want to create them, and that begin to shift those tribes to do the kinds of things I want them to do. Haven't countries can I give an always? Of that? Okay, go ahead. For example, I mean, so out in New York Harbor, you've got this statue that says, you know, give me your huddled masses yearning to be feet. We have a narrative in this country, or we had a narrative in this country, that everybody agreed upon about what it meant to be an American when it came to immigration, right? It was, you know, that immigrants, you know, we're all immigrants. Everybody comes from someplace else. We all work hard. We all pull our bootstraps up. And, you know, you end up with all these World War II movies with all these different kinds of people. And that was pretty universal. Now, that narrative about what it means to be an American is under attack. Now you're getting people who are saying, no, wait a minute, immigrants are rapists, and they're murderers, and they're stealing your jobs. 
that's an example of a weaponized narrative attack. It's taking something that united us about what we mean to be an American and divides us now and splits us up. That was an intentional attack, and that's what the weaponized narrative is interested in fighting. But, but haven't they also been used to make us uh, uh, feel consolidate feelings? For example, can the U.S. calling itself the shining city on the hill be seen as an example of an internal narrative? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Um, and and that's, that's part of the challenge of trying to navigate this new territory. Every, every powerful country has what's called an exceptionalist narrative. That is to say they have a, a story about themselves that is foundational. So in the United States, it's shining city on a hill. It's, it's what we call a creedal narrative. That is to say it's not based on blood. It's not based on soil. It's based on the fact that we share a creed, and that creed builds a shining city on the hill. That's our narrative. Uh, it's our exceptionalist narrative. But then uh, people China, disagree as to what that, that creed is. We have some people say we're Christian nations. Some people say we right. are a secular nation. We can go on and on and on. There are all sorts of other variations. Well, well you the always, shining city always... on the hill at four was, was the, is the notion that we are something that the, that the world can look up to. That's the, the heart of that narrative, that we're something special that other people can emulate. That's, and now, the way that's under attack is by saying, uh, actually, uh, America is screwed up, democracy is screwed up, the Western Alliance is screwed up, it's not something to be, you know, it's, it's racist, it's, you, you, you name it, there's a bazillion ways to attack the shining city on the hill that make that we always used to agree upon, that America was something special. That's the nature of the weaponized narrative attack is by saying that, no, actually, America is all messed up. And, astonishingly now, you're getting Americans who agree with that. Well, to some degree, aren't they pointing to real uh, facts? Uh, there, there are all those problems that we have to contend with. Well, sure. and, and that's an important point. I mean, the narratives are generalizations. And when you, particularly when you have a, a fairly simple exceptionalist narrative for a very complex culture, um, there's going to be all kinds of different interpretations and, and conflicts over sub-narratives. What does this really mean? What does that mean? Are we really providing equal opportunity? Um, and the kind of conflicts you're talking about. The, and, and the United States has always had those splits. I mean, if you, if you go back, uh, anti-immigration uh, um, sentiment, for example, has, has always been a part of the United States in one way or another directed against whatever group happens to be the most apparent at the time. What has changed is not so much that we don't continue internally to, to try to figure out what the narrative means. What's changed, I think, is at least a couple of things. The first is that it used to be that those dialogues and conflicts about what the narrative meant tended to be undertaken as part of a broader exploration of what it meant to be American. Now they're undertaken right. to be tribal. And that makes a huge difference, because once I begin to split into tribes... I also make myself very vulnerable to manipulation by, in this case, uh, Russia. Uh, Russia didn't invent uh, the race issues in the United States. Uh, Russia didn't invent the fact that guns are a, um, a flashpoint for a number of people. Uh, what Russia did do was learn how to take advantage of that in order to manipulate behavior to accomplish certain goals. For example, to suppress potential votes for Hillary in the northern tier of states. So it's not so much that the narratives have changed, it's that the social structure within which that narrative occurs has shifted fundamentally much more towards tribalism, and uh, our adversaries have learned how to take advantage of that to attack the United States in new and very dangerous ways. But before we get to Russia, and I'm 
want to talk about it in just a moment. I want to go back to something else that you were talking about. For many years, there were laws that excluded various nationalities from coming into this country. Some of them, the ones that applied to Asians, only uh, were ended in the 1970s. So while they were in effect, did we avoid the kind of, uh, of tensions that we have today because it was just the way things were? Did, when we got rid of those laws, did we open up a Pandora's box? Not really. What's, I mean, new, if you... what's new is not the divisions in, uh, in, in the United States. What's new is not what's wrong with the United States. There's plenty that's wrong with the United States. What's new is Tell that is to Governor that... Cuomo. <laughs> there you go. But the, I mean, what's new is that you've all of a sudden got a, uh, a sudden fire hose gush of information that's coming at you that people can't handle. That's the weaponized narrative attack. I mean, all of a sudden, if you're getting things coming at you in social media and email and a zillion other ways, you know, it used to be that we had three television stations and you got Uncle Walter up there and he would give you the, the, he would say at the end of the night, that's the way it was and everybody would pretty much agree. Now, what's new and what's being, what's the, at the heart of this, of, of this explosion is that if you've got a fire hose of attacks coming at you, you don't know what to believe anymore, and that's why this is suddenly such an effective tool, and it's what also caught us by surprise in 2016. Now, before we get to Russia and the United States, what kinds of narratives did Russia create about Ukraine? Why was it important to have people think of Ukraine not as a separate nation, but as an integral part of the greater Russia? And of course, uh, that especially applies to Crimea. Well, there, there are a number of reasons. I mean, the the use of of narrative by Russia and Ukraine uh, is still being studied, uh, particularly by countries like the Balts, where they're afraid that the Russians are doing the same thing. Uh, one of the one of the reasons that you develop a narrative like that, uh, and this goes way back into Soviet times, and indeed it goes back to to early Marxist times, eighteen forty eight is what you're doing is you're learning how to avoid the enemy's power, in this case, conventional power, or, for example, the United, the potential that the United States would, would intervene uh, with conventional military force in Ukraine, to undermine the possibility that that power would be applied by doing disinformation. What's changed, as Joel has pointed out, is that we now have much more effective ways to do disinformation, and because the information environment has changed so much, we also have the ability to confuse the situation and thereby to render uh, political opposition and even military opposition much less likely. So let's, let's take Ukraine. You, you come up with, let's take a very simple narrative, uh, the idea of, of Novorossiya that, that uh, Ukraine has always been a part of Russia. It's part of the Eurasian Empire, which is Russia. Uh, and therefore, this is not an invasion. This is simply the normal course of reestablishing what Russia truly is, and Ukraine is a part of that. Well, that accomplishes a couple of things. Internally, it helps you to prepare your domestic audience for uh, possible casualties and the cost of, of the conflict, uh, but it also makes them proud of being part not of uh, Russia, but of the Eurasian Empire, of which Ukraine is a logical part. In the West, if you do it right, what it does is it makes it easier for people that don't want to have to respond to an invasion to avoid it by saying it's not an invasion, it's a reversion to norm which is what uh, right. played in Italy, played in Germany, um, played to some extent even in the United States. So what you do is you use the narrative in a number of different ways, depending on your audience, to help you project your power. And that's the bottom line of what the Russians were doing in Ukraine, projecting power. And they did it very successfully. My guests on Leonard Lopez at Large today are Brad Allenby and Joel Garreau, who are the co-directors of the Arizona State University uh, venture called Weaponized Narrative Initiative. This is WBAI New York 99.5 FM. Uh, when did nations first start using narrative as a, as a tool of foreign policy? And is it different from propaganda? 
Well, propaganda has been around since uh, 2,000, 3,000 years. People have been, you know, lying for a long time in, in the, in the uh, service of trying to expand the state power. That's not new. What's new is the sheer overwhelming speed and gush of it that's overwhelming people's res- uh, ability to respond. That's what we never had before, and that's what, you know, when Brad and I suddenly were beginning to look at this, you know, in 2015 and 2016, we realized, you know, especially in, you know, starting in, in Eastern Europe, we realized the Russians had just invaded a sovereign country, and they'd gotten away with it. This was, you know, an expansion of warfare by other means. They had just literally gotten away with murder. That was novel. That the, that it, that it would work was novel, and that's a result of the technology suddenly. But isn't the way they this, use people? Isn't that an outgrowth of uh, things that happened earlier under the Soviet Union? Didn't the KGB in the 1950s develop a toolkit of active measures to try to undermine Western societies by spreading misinformation? For example, the, the KB, KGB tried to spread a story about JFK's assassin Lee Harvey Oswald and his connection to the CIA and the FBI. Oh, sure. Right. And I it mean, didn't work. It didn't and work. The, the difference is that back then it didn't work because you didn't have you know people who were who were susceptible to uh, this gush of information, right, Brad? Par- partially. I mean, the other thing to remember is that the the reason that the Russians are good today at weaponized narrative is partially because they were good at disinformation. And just to be clear, the United States was also running disinformation campaigns. Certainly that's what the uh, Soviet Union would have called it. What has changed? So that I was the Cold that, War. The, the, that, that was, was the part Cold of the Cold War. War, and that was a war of information rather than uh, any uh, war that involved weapons. Well, or was I mean, the information it, it the was, weapon? It was a full spectrum war. I mean, you had disinformation conflict. You had conflict in um, in places like Congo and Angola and even Vietnam that were uh, surrogate conflicts that the great powers tried hard not to face one another uh, directly in because that raised the possibility of nuclear confrontation. So, so they had these proxy wars. Let's just let's be sure, make it clear. There's a difference here during. During the Cold War, I mean, we didn't hide under our desks in our schoolyards for nothing. Uh, you know, we were, uh, you know, we were really worried that that the, that the planet was going to blow up. This was a real hot war, that was, and 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 the and the propaganda campaigns were, uh, you know, were in were in helping to that. But it was definitely, you know, secondary to the fact that nuclear weapons were aimed at us, and everybody knew it. I never understood Today. why I had to hide under my desk if a nuclear weapon uh, had uh, exploded over New York. After all, I would have been incinerated under my desk just as easily as, uh, as if I had been sitting at the desk. Yeah, that was, that was like crazy. I told that this was so that was propaganda to some degree, wasn't it? It was all yes. meant to yes. prepare I mean, that me was, for what? something else? Part of it, yeah, part of it was to try to give Americans the sense that there was something they could do uh, in the face of nuclear war, and um, and it became pretty clear to everybody that was trying to hide under their desk that that wasn't going to work. But let's let's jump to the point of what's different. So we know that disinformation has been going on for a long, long time. But there's at least two things that are different that are critical. The first is the amount of information in the world the volume and the velocity, what that's done is that's overwhelmed our psychological ability to understand the world that we're in. We know from behavioral economics, from advances in in, uh, personal and and community psychology, uh, from neuroscience, we're beginning to identify heuristics that people who are stressed by information overload fall back on. And those heuristics short-circuit reason and go directly to the application of narrative. So, for example, if I hit you with too much information about a complex world, what you're going to do is not try to figure out every piece of information I give you. You're going to fall back on things like, well, my friends believe this. Um, I heard Leonard say this on the radio, so I believe it. Um, so you're going to fall back on on structures that are not rational, but reflect your effort to deal with the flood of information. 
So the first thing that's changed is the amount of information. The second thing that's changed is we're beginning to learn a lot more about cognition and how to manipulate it. So while we were trying to manipulate people and have been for 2,000 years uh, in, the, in the Cold War, we were kind of not so good about it. I mean, ducking under your desk didn't quite cut it in terms of making you feel good about a nuclear war. But now I can go in with targeted advertisements over Facebook directed to, uh, to his universes as small as 20 people uh, that are intended to suppress their vote and have them be effective. Moreover, nobody else will know what's going on because I'm targeting such small groups of individuals. And so what's changed is the sophistication with which we can manipulate people, often without them knowing they're even being manipulated. Can you tell us about the Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg, which is also known as the Troll Farm? Oh, yeah. You want to take that, Joel? You want me Th- to? Is that funded by the, the Russian government? No. Yeah, it's, the, well, also it's indirectly. Also, Cozy Bear and Fancy Bear. This, these are the, one of the reasons that it came as such a surprise in, the, in 2015 and 2016 about how this this was being used as a, as a form of, of uh, as a battle space, was that um, we didn't see it coming because it was not being done by anything that we recognized as an army. And um, the, the, uh, the cute thing about the weaponized narrative attacks that were coming, that are now traced back to Russia, is that it was people who uh, are state-funded, but at the time, they had plausible deniability that they were. I mean, it didn't. They didn't have a flashing light that said KGB, you know, over the building or anything like that. So they had. To, so that was part of their narrative: is who us? What we're just, you know, nobody here but us chickens, right, Brad? Yeah, the IRA um, Internet Research Agency was actually directly funded by a friend of Mr. Putin's. So that gave him uh, deniability regarding those attacks. What, what the Russians tend to do, every country tends to sort of manage their cyber-slash-weaponized narrative differently. The Russians tend to uh, use uh, actually criminal organizations uh, as part of their weaponized narrative attacks. Uh, you can see this physically if you look at, for example, the Night Wolves. The, um, the motorcycle gang that, that Mr. Putin runs with, you know, he uses them uh, strategically in certain areas. Uh, for example, they've now established a little headquarters in the, in the Czech Republic, and, and, and that's his footprint into that part of Eastern Europe. Well, they're doing the same thing with things like the Internet Research Agency, so it'll be quote unquote private citizens or quote unquote criminal organizations, but they're all working with the state as part of an integrated attack. Uh, you can definitely see that pattern in Ukraine. Isn't uh, it run very much like a corporation with long hours, relatively good pay, corporate oh, yeah. goals, bonuses? Do we know how many people are working for them? Oh sure, yeah. I mean, it's it's basically a job, and and what is. There's some things, though, that are pretty interesting about it. So, so it's basically a job. You go in and, you know, you're, you're, you may be working on race in the United States, and so you may write um, uh, comments and tweets that are designed to, uh, to stir up one side of a racial disagreement, and the guy sitting next to you is going to be writing tweets and, and Facebook posts that are designed to stir up the other side. Um, because what you want to do is you want to deepen divisions in the United States, you want to increase tribalism, um, and you want, to, uh, you want to choose, of course, pre-existing areas where that's most possible. Um, and, the, and, and the other thing to keep in mind is that you have to hand it to them. They were very entrepreneurial during the early days of, this, of, of these weaponized narrative attacks. They were trying everything to see what sticks. Uh, there was no textbook about how to do this. Um, I mean, so for example, they would uh, uh, start by, you know, as, as Brad said, there'd be one guy at a desk who would be uh, stirring up everybody who was anti-gun and said, you know, oh my God, 
you know, this is this is uh, guns are terrible. Uh, everybody uh, in our schools is, uh, is 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 going to be is going to be attacked. That's that guy at desk A. Now, meanwhile, the guy at desk B was doing the same thing only on the other side. He was saying to, to the to the people who were the Second Amendment advocates. They were saying they're going to take away your guns. You know, this is a terrible and the and the interesting thing about this was that this kind of cyber attack, this kind of weaponized narrative attack, could act and, and actually ended up spilling over into the physical. So that, you know, guy in, 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 in desk A said, Okay, everybody who hates guns, come out to this location on such and such a date and such and such a time to uh, to to show what you're made of and to and to protest guns. The guy at Desk B, meanwhile, was saying to the Second Amendment types, they're going to take away your guns, why don't you come out and, you know, and stand up for your rights? And then he'd give them the same location. And so you'd end up with the two sides of the gun laws suddenly facing off with each other physically and tactically, you know, in Texas. And that is really novel, when all of a sudden you can use Facebook and everything else to get people eyeball to eyeball, you know, in a, in a way that could have led to violence. But it required them to be really knowledgeable about American attitudes. Uh, they could have slipped well, and up and people might have said, what's this all about? Yeah, that's a yeah. question. One of the things that we haven't answered is if you look at, if you look at some of their advertisements, um, some of their efforts on Facebook, some of their posting, um, they're pretty primitive. But if you look at some of them, they are very, very effective and well-designed and display a deep knowledge of American political and cultural psychology. Uh, and you wonder where an that open... came from. Exactly, and, and we don't know. Perhaps um, they had help in the United States. That some that's... people are suggesting that. We could tell that's you that never crossed our mind. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, how, did, Joel, they, how, how did they hide sorry. the fact that these posts were coming from Russia? Oh, that's they really didn't. I mean, they they hit it enough so that um, so that the public was confused. But in terms of of technical craft, they really didn't bother to hide it. I mean, you know, Fancy Bear, Cozy Bear, um, those were clearly Russian operations, and they were clearly directed at the United States. WikiLeaks clearly working closely with the Russians. Um, and the Russians really didn't bother to hide it. Guccifer 2.0, um, again, clearly a Russian agent. I mean, he didn't even, he, he pretended to be uh, Romanian, I think it was, but he didn't even really try to, to even use proper Romanian. Um, so, so what you had was a fairly interesting signal by the Russians, that they were in fact doing this, what are you going to do about it? And our response, frankly, was virtually non-existent, which is, which is why the Russians are continuing to this day. And, and that played into the narrative that America was weak. Now, yes. were, how were we aware? Why didn't President Obama act faster and more decisively when he learned about Russian meddling? I suspect if you talk to... Uh, President Obama and some of his administration, they would now say that that was probably one of their biggest mistakes. I think that a lot of it was, I mean, so, so think about what possibility we have today using today's technology. We can scrape the Internet using various forms of information that you put all over the Internet. We can identify your psychological type we can figure out what your voting preference would be, and we can choose to suppress or stimulate you to vote. Now, we can't do things like change you from, a, say, a, a, a Secretary Clinton supporter to a President Trump supporter. You can't, you can't make those jumps. But we can certainly manipulate you to behave in ways that, um, that we want you to behave without you knowing it. Moreover, within a year or two, we're going to have technology, CGI technology, computer technology, uh, image generation technology, and voice technology that will allow people to make videos of anybody saying anything that are completely false, that are virtually um, uh, un... You can't tell the difference between them and the real thing, which means that in a year or two, 
um, the American public is going to be completely unable to know what really happened. Uh, uh, judging from what I've been seeing on cable news, it's probably already happening. But yes, forgive the joke. See, they got you. They got you. They, you already believe it. I'm speaking with Brad Allenby, who is the author of a book called The Rightful Place of Science, Future Conflict and Emerging Technologies, published by Consortium for Science, Policy and Outcomes, and Joel Garreau, who is the author of Radical Evolution, the promise and peril of enhancing uh, uh, our minds, our bodies. It's published by Doubleday. They are co-directors of the Arizona, Arizona State University uh, weaponized uh, uh, narrative. Uh, what is it? Initiative. Uh, initiative. initiative. It. I, I can't read my own handwriting sometimes. <laughs> And we are returning now to our two guests, Brad Allenby and Joel Garreau. What countries besides Russia use weaponized narrative? It's spreading fast. Um, it, and one of the spread. things about, about these different countries is, as Brad uh, alluded to, you can kind of see the fingerprints of these folk. It's very difficult to trace the source back electronically, but... The, 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 the Russians have a distinct style that just say, oh, yeah, that's St. Petersburg. But the other people are like the Chinese, the alt-right, ISIS, Iran, North Korea. Everybody's jumping into the game to the point now where, you know, we're now seeing attacks on candidates that seem to be done by, you know, the, the very local, like, you know, the, the, ma the mayor's race for Sonoma County, California, and you say, wow, why are they in on that? And we're beginning to wonder whether this is beginning to trickle down to the point where you're having copycats here in the states who are thinking, God, this works so well, you know, on, on, on the national and international level. Let me try it in Sonoma County. And what is the ultimate goal, to get certain people elected or to just be as divisive as possible? That create, depends you know, that, that's on the bottom line chaos. Yeah, it depends on the state. So, for example, um, to take Russia, uh, there's a number of different goals that are met by a successful weaponized narrative campaigns against the United States. One is it feeds the internal narratives that support Mr. Putin. So, the more he can show that the United States is chaotic amoral, um, uh, and, and a failing culture, then the stronger his government looks as uh, in contrast. So it feeds his internal narratives. It feeds his ability to project his power, particularly in the near abroad, in, in, in Eastern Europe, in Ukraine, uh, because uh, it means that the Americans are completely tied up arguing with themselves uh, rather than focusing on what he's trying to do in, in Eastern Europe, which is to reassert uh, Russian influence. Uh, and over the long term, it weakens the United States, which means that he is able to um, uh, uh, exert his power in other areas uh, without the United States being able to intervene. So, so it serves a number of points. One way to think about weaponized narrative is to go back to where it came from, which is uh, after, particularly after Iraq won, both Russia and China realized that, that there was no way they could build a traditional military force that could compete with the Americans. Uh, and that's not hubris. That's just that was a realistic analysis by uh, major adversaries. But, of course, if you're... If you want to be a world power, you can't just sit back. So what you do is you find a different way to, uh, to project your power. Uh, it turns out that weaponized narrative is a brilliant way for adversaries of the United States to attack the United States without running the risk of triggering a conventional response, a conventional military response. But don't they find their audience based on individual Internet searches? So uh, when ISIS is uh, trying to uh, appeal to alienated Islamic youth, uh, they would uh, find that person because of an Internet search? Would that apply to pretty much all of the different groups that you mentioned? 
It depends on how sophisticated the effort is. With ISIS, uh, they knew a lot about their fairly specific audience. So they could, for example, uh, put out sites that would attract uh, young male, um, uh, possibly alienated uh, Muslims. So, so they knew their audience. You'll note that they didn't go after, for example, America as a whole, because that was, that was not what they knew, that was not what they did well. Uh, with the Russians, because it was a general attack on the United States as opposed to a specific subgroup of the United States, uh, they were able to take a much broader view and identify targets of opportunity. One of the ways to think about Russian strategy in this is they're like a deadly virus. Uh, their goal is to infect the body politic, that is to infect the United States. But how you do that is very tactical. So if you're a virus, maybe you, maybe you get on a, a doorknob, uh, maybe you are spread by somebody sneezing, uh, you use whatever vehicle works. And that's basically what the Russians did, and they're doing. The Russians are very experimental in terms of the details, as, as is ISIS, um, or, or not so much ISIS anymore, but, but uh, jihadist uh, Islam, uh, as is China, uh, as is the alt-right and the, alt, uh, the alt-right and the alt-left in the United States. Has the United so, States... Uh, go ahead, finish. I'm sorry. Yeah, the... One of the things to think about in terms of weaponized narrative is it's kind of like guns. Uh, they may have started out primarily being state weapons, but now everybody's got it, and everybody's going to use it. Has if there's it... a politico in the United States that isn't thinking about how to use narrative and Cambridge Analytica tactics, um, then they're verging on malpractice because that's the state of the art. Has the United States been so vulnerable to weaponized narrative attacks because one of our core principles is freedom of speech, the, the First Amendment? Yes. Yeah, that, that's one of the things that, one of the things that so when we start thinking about, you know, so what do you do? But we, the Weaponized Narrative Initiative has got um, two parts. One is the research directorate, which is uh, what Brad uh, is, is uh, in charge of, and that's, that deals with uh, the question of what's coming at us and, you know, and what does it all mean? And then there's the one that I'm uh, interested in, which answers the question, well, all right, so what do you do about it? And, um, you know, these attacks are very canny. They, you know, they, they are just below the level of responding to it with bullets and bombs. Uh, and, and they calibrate that intentionally. They don't, you know, if, if all of a sudden this became a hot war, they lose and they know it. So they're keeping it just below that level, and um, and so as a result, you know it's very difficult for us to respond, especially because the, there's part. You know, you talked about our the shining city on the hill that he, that's the United States narrative earlier in the in the program, and you know part of our, our exceptionalism, part of our aren't we great, is this notion that you know free speech is 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 part of what we do. Uh, we have a division, a church and state division between uh, uh, the military and its civilian leadership. Uh, we have a division between government and private enterprise. We have all these divisions that we've been exceedingly proud of. Well, it's exactly those divisions that the weaponized narrative attacks are, are now driving a truck through. So if you ask yourself, well, how are we going to solve this problem? It really gives you gas because you're wondering whether we have to get rid of the First Amendment. To what extent do uh, First Amendment forbid. decisions about whether speech should be allowed or prevented now rest with private firms with little or no government supervision? Are we relying on Google, Facebook, Twitter, and other social media to do things that uh, the government can't do? Um, yeah, we've the answer to the that is, right, is right? yeah. The answer to that is is yes, but but it's it's subtle. When, when the First Amendment was, was written, the, the concern was the power of Leviathan, the power of the king, the power of the government. So the First Amendment said nothing about private industry, uh, because at the time, of course, that wasn't an issue. Private industry had very little to say about, about 
speech at all because there wasn't that much private industry in the in the modern sense. Um, and so, so the government was what was the uh, the focus of the First Amendment. The First Amendment, as you know, means the government can't limit speech, but it doesn't doesn't say anything about say social media. The problem that we've got now is that social media has become the major way in which people can actually speak. That is to say, you and I are are free to talk to each other on the street, but if we really want to make ourselves heard, then it's Twitter, then it's Facebook, then it's YouTube, um, then it's it's, uh, uh, podcasts. And if those are all in private hands, those become the mechanisms of speech. One of the interesting things that's happened over the last couple of years without people really noticing it is that the government has basically given up on, uh, on speech and tossed it over the fence to people like Facebook. Now, they really don't want it, right? Because as soon as they start, as they, as soon as they start trying to exercise some kind of control over the weirdness that might show up on, on their platforms, then you get, for example, the President of the United States saying that they're opposing this or opposing that and that, that they're violating free speech and, and, and that sort of thing, which gets them in a political tangle they don't want to be in. Did so we learn problem, from... Another point about these corporations is that you know we have historically thought of these corporations as, quote, American, end quote. But that's increasingly debatable. These are now multinational uh, organizations that are approaching being sovereign unto themselves. They don't really have to be part of anybody's parade. Uh, they can do what's important to them. So, for example, we've been very interested in the way Microsoft has been choosing to go after the Russians. Um, with their, They have a, a means by which they can tell uh, when the Russians are up to, to bad stuff, and they're doing something about it. They're acting on it. Well, that used to be the function of government to do stuff like that. Well, now it's Microsoft, and you start asking, wow, when did Microsoft become a sovereign nation? Didn't we learn from congressional testimony by Facebook and other social media companies that the Russian government set up false Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram accounts? Uh, it, it must have been difficult for them to determine whether they were the real thing or not. Well, but part of it is is a policy decision by the uh, large media comp- uh, social media companies, and that is once you begin um, – trying to force everybody to identify themselves properly once you begin policing people who who post on your on your platform then you begin to assume responsibility and in today's fragmented and very tribal world then you begin to piss off somebody somewhere so they were trying to avoid having to do that in the first place and i think the second thing that has caused a a, a great deal of angst is i don't think anybody realized the power that that the development of of behavioral economics cognitive science the 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 knowledge side combined with the new social media and ai tools had created so i think that that the reason you didn't see a lot of reaction out of secretary clinton uh secretary clinton's campaign and the obama administration um uh, and indeed, why you saw Facebook being relatively cavalier about whether or not they were being used by the Russians, I think a lot of that was the fact that they hadn't yet realized how very effective the Russians had already learned how to be. And so I think that the speed of technological evolution caught everybody flat-footed. And I think that's part of what we're in now. We're trying to play catch-up, but we're playing catch-up in an arena where the cycle time of new technology is getting faster and faster. My guests and on that's today's to Let It Low Pit at Large are Brad Allenby and Joel Garo, co-directors of Arizona State University's Weaponized Narrative Initiative. Although the United States dominates as a military superpower, why do politicians continue to ask for increases in defense budget for new weapon systems? We spend... Uh, close to what the entire rest of the world spends combined, uh, in in light of what we've been discussing, uh, 
isn't that just a waste of money? You always fight the last war. They always think that whatever it is they were doing, you know, uh, a year ago or 10 years ago or 100 years ago, they're always looking backwards to the war. They're never looking forward. It's, I mean, Brad and I have been astonished at the extent to which, you know, we, we were kind of proud of ourselves that we managed to get this even being to talked about to the extent that it was. You know, there's now slowly being a, uh, a movement in which there's some, suddenly the Defense Department and others are beginning to realize the implications of this. But um, we're behind. I mean, we're in this, un, we're in this, un, this un, um, unprecedented situation of being uh, in, a, in a battle space where that's in, in which technology, which is supposed to be our strong suit, is at the heart of it, and we're losing. Well, I think I think it's worse than that. I think I think we've essentially been Pearl Harbored, and and the interesting thing to me is so few Americans even realize that we got Pearl Harbored. I mean, the the advantage of a conventional conflict, if you want to call it the, uh, an advantage, is that you know it happened, as you pointed out at the beginning of the show. When tanks roll over your border, you know you've been invaded. But what's happened now? is that we may well have had the installation of a government that was not popularly elected, that was in essence uh, put there by the Russians, um, uh, at least in some kind of contributory uh, contributory way. What do we do about that? How do we respond? Uh, What happens when you've got an administration that at the top refuses to believe that the Russians have done anything wrong while in the military and the security uh, uh, organizations you're trying to protect the country against the Russians who are continuing to do exactly what they did? It's it's an amazing situation. Does weaponized narrative need to create a coherent counter-narrative in order to be effective? Is it sufficient to simply cast out? So I'm thinking, for example, about the underlying power of the Bertha movement, uh, not to simply question President Obama's citizenship, but perhaps also to shake the trust that uh, citizens may have in government documents? Exactly. Um, I think, so one of the questions is not just defense, but what should the United States do in response? To date, The reason the Russians, and we focus on the Russians, but it's important to remember that this is a broad category of weapons with a lot of people playing in this space now. Uh, But but let's focus on the Russians because our our information there is reasonably good. Uh, One of the the things that the Russians uh, are able to do is to create and play on that confusion while maintaining a narrative at home that's very secure and powerful. So what that implies, I think, if you're the United States, is we had conventional dominance. They now have weaponized military dominance. Do we try to attack them on that asymmetric playing field, or do we figure out something new? The problem with attacking the Russians in terms of weaponized narrative is that they're already in this kind of strange postmodern space where our attacks are likely to be ineffectual. What we need is a new asymmetric warfare. For example, um, if the president were to get up and say, you know, if these attacks continue, I think it might be a good idea to provide a massive tax relief to the fracking industry then I think it's highly likely that we would see weaponized narrative from the Russian side at least cease, because they're a petrostate, and if we're the swing producer in petroleum and we threaten those revenues, that becomes a major deterrent. But right now we use sanctions as a deterrent. Have yeah, they been well, ineffective? you see how well that's worked. What I've always wanted to do is start a satire and ridicule brigade. I'm not sure I want fracking reinst- I, I'm not sure I want to encourage fracking. So I'm, uh, I understand the point that you're making, but that might be self-defeating. Well, so there's there's another way that um, that you can look for Russian influence. Um, there there is some evidence that 
particularly in Europe, environmental campaigns against fracking have been supported indirectly by the Russians precisely for that reason. And I mean, so, so remember, with all of these interventions, I mean, in, in the race area, in the gun area, in the abortion area, in the anti-vax area, with all of these interventions, the fact that the Russians have intervened doesn't mean that the underlying issue isn't an important one that has to be, that has to be looked at and understood. In just what few- it does mean is that we have, a, we have a new form of conflict that is being very effectively used against us. In just the few moments that we have left, uh, I'm wondering how the both of you got involved in this weaponized narrative. The, the weaponized narrative initiative is part of a larger group called the Center on the Future of War. So is this just part of what you're studying? The Center on the Future of War is a partnership between Arizona State University and New America one of the most renowned think tanks in the Washington, D.C. area. And the point of it is not to, uh, I mean, if you want peace, you have to study war. That's why, that's why we're, uh, we're into that. We're not warmongers, but we, you know, we are, we're, I mean, I'm a conscientious objector. What am I doing here? But, the, uh, but, you know, but I mean, if you do want peace, you have to understand what's coming at you. Now, back in 2015 and 2016, when all this was going down, and Brad and I were talking to each other, you know, we talked then about trying to raise the flag about what was happening, and we realized we had a problem, that people would think we were nuts. Uh, you know, we, 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 we just were afraid that, that if, you know, if we suddenly said the Russians are attacking the election, and, it's, and it's, this is really serious, you know, we were talking about this back before most people were taking President Trump seriously as a candidate. And so, you know, we had our own problems in terms of credibility. It wasn't until after the election that we finally said, okay, screw it. This is too big, and we've got to go public, and we did. And that's how we, and that was the start of uh, weaponized narrative entering the language in the the weaponized narrative initiative. Are the people who have expertise in national security and intelligence operations taking the threat of weaponized narrative seriously? I think at least some of them are, but I think the problem is institutionally we're incapable of moving fast enough to respond effectively, at least so far. And there, do you have any proposals in a minute? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, should should we be doing the same thing? It's to learn from the guys who are, you know, who have had the most experience with us and who are doing the best, and that's all the guys in Eastern Europe who have been having this, you know, who have had the Russian attacking at them. And they have been fighting back, and they have learned a few things. And, you know, and learning from uh, the uh, the Estonians, of all people. I mean, those are the guys who really know this stuff. The Estonians, you know, you have to look it up on a map. But as I said, I always wanted a, uh, a laughter and ridicule brigade. <laughs> I think Putin is a big, fat target for, for satire. And for and for and, and for comic books and cartoons. And would he be you know, as you vulnerable? Know how I want to take this to them. It's with a laughter and ridicule brigade. Because if you can get the Russian people laughing at him, he's toast. Well, could we do the same sort of thing to Putin that the the, the Russian trolls have been doing to us? It, has there Not, been any attempt? I think you'd want to be asymmetric. You'd want to, You wouldn't want yeah. to just do a mirror image. You'd want to hit. You want to aim at their vulnerabilities, which are different from ours. Right. And, and you want to think broadly. I mean, But they the control reason, the Internet a lot more than the U.S. government does, so they might very well be able to protect themselves. Well, the Chinese are the ones to, to watch at that, because we, we talk a lot about the Russians, but Russia is actually a fairly weak state. I mean, partially because of their, their corruption, they haven't been able to build strong economic institutions. In some ways... The Russians are weakening us, but of course, it's the Chinese where the real power lies, at least at this point. That's the ones, they're the ones we're worried about. Well, that brings us to the end of today's show. My great thanks to our guests, uh, who uh, are Brad Allenby and Joel Garreau. Uh, we want to thank Deborah Freeman, who produced this segment, Charlie Morrow, who composed our theme music, 
Reggie Johnson, who was at the audio controls, and my assistant producer, Jesse Lent, who makes things run smoothly. Modern Lopate and Large come to you on Saturdays at 4 and Tuesdays at noon. You can subscribe to Leonard Lopate at Large podcast on iTunes and by clicking on Robin Hood Radio's archive program site, which is robinhoodradio.com. You can also check out Leonard Lopate at Large Facebook page. We hope to see you next week. Thank you.